to their smooth journey in research. Perfect. Second important thing that I want to reiterate and highlight, it's a very basic, but email etiquettes. I see a lot of students as well as researchers and supervisees in rush or because they're worried or, you know, uh, they have time constraint, they forget that. So three very basic things. Salutation. If you are emailing uh, an editor, a reviewer, a supervisor, you have to be very formal in composing your message. Second thing is wording. How do you compose it? The way you say things, although may not sound weird when you say them face to face, however, in wording, they might come off as rude. So be very careful because your wording stays and it can have a lot of impact on how your work is being received even before the reviewer or the supervisor reads your chapter. And uh, even in formal submission, when you're submitting to a journal, you have to compose a cover letter. So it applies the same email etiquettes apply to the cover letter as well. And then the wait time, usually five working days is the wait time you should keep in mind before um, sending another email to your supervisor. That leads us to the working etiquettes. Two weeks for review, I request my students to give me, and really that's the time that I was uh, given as a supervisee myself. So you have to be very respectful of your editor, your, your, your reviewers, or your supervisor's time. A lot of students don't consider that if it's a weekend or a summer break, your supervisor or the person you're working with is not officially supposed to work. So you have to be very respectful of those boundaries. And that reminds me of one of my students was not, um, didn't finish their work on time. They sent me an email on a Friday night saying that if you review it by Sunday, I'll be able, able I will be able to submit it by Monday because that's the deadline. Uh, so even before I read their work, I was very, um, very shocked at the entitlement and the wording and the expectations on behalf of the researcher. So it's a weekend, it's summer break, as well as you did not give me the review time, and then you're expecting me to sign it over the weekend. Uh, you have to be very careful and you have to be well aware of these working etiquettes, especially in professional world, because these things stay with you when you go in academic world for jobs. AI policies, you have a lot of sessions. I'm not going to take a lot of time on that. It's just that whatever AI policy your institute or your department is following, make sure you're following that. If you make a mistake, be honest about it. A lot of time is sometimes wasted when the students think they are smart and the supervisor is not going to be aware of the mistakes, but the thing is they do. And if you are going to waste time wrongly defending your mistakes, it is just going to waste more of your time and energy. So even if you commit a mistake, be honest about accepting it and ask your supervisor how you can correct it. That leads to my next point that you have to have a work plan in order for all this to work. And one important thing that I want to highlight in this point is that really students submitted their first draft right before deadline, expecting the supervisor to sign the draft. First draft is never the last draft. You have to keep time for multiple revisions. So you have to plan your work in a way that the final revisions is done before the deadline, meaning you have to start well in advance. And that I also, uh, right there, I also want to highlight that if in BS you get, let's say six months or four months of a research time in master's one year, in PhD three years, or however your uh, institute uh, gives you the time, there is a reason for that because it does take you to uh, that amount of time to conduct a good piece of research. However, what happens when it comes to research, especially in masters, I have seen students enroll them in different degrees, in different uh, courses, um, in different certifications or plan different things uh, in their life, major events right before the start of their research, thinking, oh, now they're done with the classes, so they have time. Trust me, you do not have extra time. You have time, right amount of time to conduct a good research. So be very careful and uh, plan everything accordingly. Do not overburden yourself and that would help you to avoid the burnout. And that takes me to my second last point is the self-reward. 
that is very important that you avoid the burnout and you take care of your mental and physical health because usually research calls for long working hours sitting down and that takes a toll on your mental and physical health please take care of that personally the tip that i can give you from my personal experience is that after every submission i would plan a self reward and i would highly suggest you to do that because it not only encourages you to do the work in a you know good amount of time and meet the deadline but it also uh, refreshes you after you're done and it can be any way you like it can be a trip small trip it can be dining out with your friends However, self reward sounds to you. I highly encourage you to take those small uh, breaks after you do some work and reward yourself in order to avoid the burnout. I have personally seen people they are so burned out, burnt out that it affects their relationships around them, their social life around them, and alongside their own mental and physical health. So it is very important, especially when you're conducting the longer research, the graduate and postgraduate level research it is very important that you take care of yourself. Last point that might seem counterproductive, but trust me, it's not because uh, the entire research seminar has been about publications and research and it's very important. What I am trying to say that might seem counterproductive, but it is not, is that publication is important, but it's not end of the world. And why I say that is because please avoid questionable practices in order to get published only do it the right way because it's a really really small world what you say what you do it becomes your it becomes a part of your character and it stays with you and it goes around the world no matter which institute you go to or which country you move to your repute stays with you so avoid questionable practices and how you can do that is when you're enjoying the research process be actually curious about the thing that you're doing be actually interested in the work that you're doing and once you're conducting good research once you're enjoying the research process you will automatically uh, be producing the work uh, that is publishable that people would want to know about in presentations in conferences through journals so whatever you do from we have a whole range of questionable practices i'm not going to go into detail of that but whatever you do enjoy the research process and avoid the questionable practices and there are very good ways to actually get published and speak at the conferences which takes me to our next speaker um, i would pass it on to dr farasad who would actually teach you and tell you more good tips to actually get published and to go to conferences and you present your research in the right way. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Meer. Uh, now I am the next presenter and for my part of presentation, I'm going to talk about spotting presenting and publication opportunities uh, in your research. But let me begin from uh, what Dr. Meer said earlier that please be sure to take out some time to relax. So this reminds me of my experience when I was uh, uh, writing my doctoral dissertation and I was near completion. I still remember the amount of stress and pressure that I had uh, at that time. So what I used to do is I would, I would give myself a task or a target, and then I would also decide a treat afterwards. So that treat uh, used to be maybe watching a movie or a show on a famous show on Netflix or hanging out with friends or something like that. So yeah, Dr. Meer's discussion just reminded me of that and I wanted to talk about that. Uh, well, anyways, as the title of our today's panel is and what the books do not teach us. So uh, for, for, for my presentation, essentially, I wanted to talk about uh, experiences and I would be sharing some anecdotes as well. And especially the kind of experiences and ideas that cannot be found in books that are not discussed in uh, classroom settings. So uh, I remember when I was an MPhil student at Punjab University, I used to have this question a lot. How do I know uh, what are conference presentation opportunities? How do I know what are prestigious platforms in my field? And how do I know if a conference is uh, predatory and all of uh, these questions so uh, to answer this i think i think it is very important for researchers especially in the beginning to identify uh, what are some scholars 
and what are what are some authors whose works or whose writings influence us or inspire us so identify those names and then see what platforms these scholars are joining or have joined and um, what are the forums what are the conference uh, opportunities where these uh, scholars are presenting their works because eventually you will be joining the same conversation that they are having if like the area what you are expanding um, and 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 the research project that uh, uh, you are developing and then to my mind it is very important for researchers especially for early career scholars to uh, uh, to present uh, at conferences so here on the screen you can you can see i have written uh, this uh, trajectory of research let me let me share something uh, let me share something with you that uh, my uh, program director of uh, 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 phd shared with us uh, especially during the doctoral program orientation he said that uh, this should be the trajectory of your publication. So when you begin with a classroom assignment, or it may even be a term paper, anything that you have written in your class, in MPhil class or PhD class, so send that paper, uh, improve that paper for a conference presentation opportunity, and then get it published. So that this was the trajectory that he shared with us, that it should be paper, presentation, publication paper, presentation, and publication. And then he further said that after you have published, let's say four or five papers on a same topic, then maybe it's time for you to consider some, uh, to, to consider a book draft uh, um, um, uh, on that area. So uh, I really, I have really uh, found that helpful and I wanted to share this with you especially. And for me too, all of my, uh, not all, well, many of my uh, uh, publications that I have in my CV, uh, if not all, uh, many of them uh, were actually uh, presented at conferences. So uh, most of my publications, uh, like their departure points were the conference presentation opportunities. And I can say, and I must say, that all of uh, my conference presentations were actually uh, uh, the earlier versions of uh, drafts that I presented at uh, different conferences. So that for this very reason, I think that presenting at conferences is helpful and it's important for scholars, especially early career uh, scholars. Uh, now with that, I think it's also important uh, for scholars to identify uh, what are the known platforms or prestigious platforms in their field. So for example, my field is communication studies, and I know that some, uh, some known platforms in my field, they are ICA, International Communication Association, which is a global platform it, and it has members from 80 plus countries. Another is NCA, National Communication Association. It's a bit myopic as compared to ICA because it's it's the gathering of mostly North American uh, scholars. And then there is another forum uh, with the name IAMCR, International Association for Media and Communication Research, which is essentially a consortium of uh, European scholars. Now, uh, uh, all these platforms and some of them, especially ICA, they are known uh, for leading the field. Uh, and uh, there, uh, uh, I would talk about ICA, uh, its annual convention, it's known for its flagship annual convention, which draws almost 4,000 to 5,000 scholars every year. So considering the magnitude of this conference, one can say that it's a platform that almost uh, leads the field. And I know there are uh, such platforms in other fields too, like I know there is MLA in English and there is uh, APA in psychology. So it's important for us to, uh, to identify these platforms uh, and these platforms, they also have uh, panels, uh, sorry, they also have journals on their panel, uh, which, so for example, ICA, which is leading platform in my field, they publish journals that are, um, uh, Oxford University Press actually publishes them, however, ICA owns them. Uh, and all of them are well-respected uh, journals uh, in our field. So one may ask a question that how do we know about these platforms? So my, I think uh, it's very important for us to get ourselves to talking. So talk to your professors, talk to your seniors, talk to your peers, talk to your um, 
talk to um, your colleagues and they will they will tell you about um, about this i um, it's it's important for us to join uh, uh, these professional organizations if you know i mean you we all know that there is an important section in our cvs its name is professional memberships or professional associations so uh, i know it's becoming it's it's expensive and especially for a country like pakistan it's becoming increasingly expensive to join these professional associations and to present at conferences but still there are ways one can navigate and one can uh, walk past such barriers i'll i, I can talk about that in detail during uh, the q and a uh, and let me also tell you that conferences provide us opportunities for publications yes they provide us networking opportunities not with just scholars in our field, but they also provide us networking opportunities with publishers. Um, 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 uh, my co-panelists, I am sure they have, they also have uh, experiences of presenting at conferences and they can confirm that at, at big conference platforms, there are publishers who, who come and they set up stalls and um, there you can get, an, get a chance and an opportunity to to connect with them and to explore uh, further publication possibilities and opportunities. Uh, moreover, I would also emphasize joining um, listservs. Listserv is actually an email an email list and uh, known platforms of uh, in a field they have listservs or one can also call them subscription services. In my experience. Uh, joining these listservs or subscription services is completely free. So, uh, and um, I tell this uh, to my postgrad students all the time that if you want to uh, stay updated about what are uh, 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 different publication presentation opportunities or even what are the current trends or contemporary ideas or debates in my field, so I think you should join the listservs. Um, other than that, uh, before I end, my biggest suggestion would be uh, that if you have a draft, maybe it, it comes from a class assignment or it comes from a conference presentation. So uh, just send it out uh, because, um, well, uh, find journals and do as much as research. First, look for possible journals and then do as much research as you can about the journal, then tweak and tailor your writing according to the requirements of the journal and then send it. And do not be afraid of rejections because rejections are part of the process. My colleague here, Dr. Sharoon, will be ending, will be talking about um, uh, psycho social and psychological uh, challenges um, in, in research. So uh, uh, rejection should not be a deterring factor. Just keep trying until your writing gets um, uh, a nice home. And and, and also uh, another tip that I will I actually I, I was able to figure out after several months of research. Uh, if you if you want a quick response, let's say from editors or reviewers, or uh, if you if you want publication on fast track, uh, I would suggest uh, uh, going for journals that um, like check their frequency of publication. So let's say if you uh, choose a journal that publishes six issues a year, which means they have to get their issue out in two months, which which means they will get back to you with their response, either a revision, a rejection or selection, whatever it is in a month or so. Uh, in, uh, on the other hand, if you select a journal that uh, publishes just one issue a year, it means they may take four to six months to get back to you. Well, that was all about, that was all for my part of um, our discussion. Uh, now uh, I'll pass it on to our next panelist, uh, Dr. Saklana Basha, who will talk about effective use of AI for um, a, a review, reviewing and reading and research. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and uh, good afternoon. Uh, can you hear me? I think you can hear me. Thank you so much, Dr. Chasset. Uh, actually, it is not about uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, I just slightly changed uh, my script. Uh, so, uh, I start uh, with uh, some uh, very basic and minor things that seem minor, but uh, sometimes they become very, very important because they save a lot of time and energy. 
these are very minor things, but uh, we must be uh, considering them while we start our research from the day one. While we are uh, downloading and reading different research papers and we are doing a uh, literature review, uh, what most of times our students, our scholars do, they put up all their uh, research papers and all their uh, articles, they just dump, dump it into one uh, single folder and they do not even bother about uh, changing their names, renaming, renaming those, those articles. And later on, when at some stage in the research write up, when they have to refer back to those uh, articles, it is almost impossible uh, to find those articles on time. So uh, I would suggest that uh, we need to start uh, everything with, with some discipline from the day one. We have to make our life, our research uh, process very easy. So we need to customize different folders. We can uh, customize those folders by different topics. For example, if we are downloading uh, or making a repository of uh, uh, review articles, uh, we can give it a name like review articles or some other uh, folders, research papers, uh, old ones, new ones, highly cited, low cited. And then we can choose certain particular very special articles that, we, that are very, very helpful. Then uh, we just download some uh, different uh, uh, websites and just dump them without giving them names. We should uh, name those. I always uh, give a full article name. I mean, I uh, copy the title from the paper and I put it into the title of that paper. So in this way, when I create a library, it is very handy. It is very easy for me later on when I want to revert it, but I want to find those particular search papers. I can find them with their titles. Then while we are uh, reading research articles, uh, we should be preparing notes. Uh, we should be uh, annotating. We can do this uh, uh, digitally on a computer screen or more better ways to do it manually by using a pen, pencil, which I will show you later. Uh, so, and when we find that some text is very, very important, uh, it, it talks about novelty, it talks about some fundamental science, some fundamental concepts, and we do not want to miss them because remember that later on, when after uh, we have concluded our research in now, when we'll be in the right of phase, it will be actually be those beautiful paragraphs, that beautiful technical academic jargon and the language that we should be borrowing from these research papers that we are reading today. So we need to keep a track of those articles because we will be using this particular academic formal language and this particular jargon. Uh, and we will be importing that by using our own words, uh, by giving proper citations, of course. So whenever we find some paragraph, some some beautiful sentences, some expressions, we should copy them. We should put them in separate uh, separate word files. We can give them some special titles if we want, so that uh, actually we have a record of those of those nice, fascinating things that we should be using later on with our with our own uh, interpretations. Uh, similarly, uh, when we are writing a manuscript, a big mistake that many students do: they just uh, start writing one sing single file. They keep updating it and updating it and rewriting, writing it, writing it, and at some stage, uh, God forbid, if uh, if they if the if the file is uh, getting corrupt or if they lose it, you delete it accidentally, their entire data is lost. Always remember, uh, whenever you have conducted a writing session, a major writing section uh, session, always save it in some at some data place. It can be some Google Cloud, uh, some uh, Google Drive, a OneDrive or some other space, uh, some other drive in your hard disk. And later on, when you do the next session, when you are updating the files, always start with a new name. For example, uh, if initially I'm working on some file manuscript one, and after a few days, I want to update it, I want to go further writing, then I should uh, save that previous file into some different folder, and then I uh, copy it and give it a different name. Now it will be manuscript two. Later on, it will be manuscript three, four, five, six. Now, this is to make sure that later on, due to some unfortunate incident, if your data is lost, uh, you can revert back to the most recent uh, backup file, uh, and you just you will just need a very little effort into that. So, always save those updated versions in different locations for the backup purpose. Uh, and one more thing. Uh, uh, what I have seen and, and, and what I do myself is I never write a complete research paper in, in, in one file. Uh, for example, I will write abstract in a different file. I will make a folder. For example, this is my manuscript five. 
uh, this is the uh, uh, name of my folder, this is my fifth manuscript. In that paper, uh, in that folder, I will uh, write abstract in a different file. Then when it is done, I will go to the introduction section and uh, that will be a new file. The third file will be materials and methods. The fourth file will be uh, results and discussions. The last file will be conclusion. And I will keep editing them one by one separately uh, into own. Uh, and later on, when I find that you know, this is the time to merge all those files into one manuscript, when it is in a proper and final shape, only then I should be uh, merging those files into one manuscript so that Again, if some bad incident happens and I lose all the data, at least my backup files are ready to be used again. Uh, as I said, that while uh, taking notes, uh, we can do it digitally while doing it on the screen, and we can also do it manually. In fact, uh, I find it more convenient for me uh, to read it uh, on the paper because staring at the screen is, is very difficult for some people, uh, for me. So I always... Uh, uh, read the different sections, and whenever I find something very interesting, I I annotate those uh, yeah, paragraphs, those expressions, those sentences. I uh, prepare notes on the side, and ultimately, when when I have uh, read a complete research paper, at the front page, I will write the brief brief notes about uh, that particular research paper, uh, so that later on, after a few months, when I want to re revert back to this particular paper, I don't, I will not have to find a needle in the ocean. Uh, I would just uh, just scroll down those particular folders, those files, and I, I would just look at the title pages, and I will see that which research article uh, talks about what particular topic. For example, later on, at, at some stage, for example, uh, if I find that I need some help I need to read something about FTER uh, things, then I will just come back to this paper and I will start reading those paragraphs. In this way, it will be very easy for me to revert back to this particular important data that I have already annotated and I have saved in my repository. And similarly, you can see that in, in on another page, uh, the way these are different paragraphs and different expressions, they were very, very useful for my study and I had to underline them and I had to write certain notes on the left side uh, it looks a little thing, but uh, you will feel the importance later on when at some stage while you don't write up, you will want to revert back to your own paper, uh, to some paper. You will realize, you will be having the feeling in the back of your mind that there was a paper in which something related to my current issue was uh, explained in an excellent way, in a very meticulous way, and you, uh, you are desperate to find those paragraphs which you have not annotated. Uh, you have not created notes, it will be very difficult for you to find those paragraphs uh, from so many hundreds of uh, different research papers. Uh, and last slide, uh, this is very important. I have shown this slide in the previous uh, session. And this is so important that I'm showing this again to you. Uh, and I want, and uh, you can take uh, it's a screenshot, it, it is very important. You can take the picture. Always, when your manuscript is finally, uh, finally ready for submission, give it a second review. Now ask yourself these questions about the title. Ask about abstract. Does your abstract present the rationale? Does the abstract define the purpose of the study? You have to ask certain questions about every, every section of this paper. Is the background information relevant to the study? Have the gaps in the existing literature been classified? Have the objectives been? If some of these information is missing in your article, try to find the ways that how can you incorporate this missing information because these are the international standards. Uh, while we are composing uh, different manuscripts and such articles, these are the basic guidelines that uh, we should be reviewing articles based on. Similarly, in research and uh, results and discussions, have the results been merely repeated rather than interpreted in the discussion? Have the previous studies with uh, similar findings been cited? These are different sections that we have to be uh, very uh, careful about that these things are already mentioned in your paper and once uh, you find that everything is there, then your article is ready for submission. And that's it from my side. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Saklan. Uh, your talk was helpful, especially in the context of how one can stay organized while conducting research. Our next uh, presenter now is Dr. Sharoon Hanouk, 
uh, who is going to talk about research development framework and also social and psychological uh, challenges in research. Well, over to you, Dr. Sharon. Yeah, uh, am I audible to all? Yes. So, hello. Uh, so, sorry. If you could do slide share. I think there's a researcher uh, when even if you are, if you have graduated and you are you are working as a researcher, uh, it's not the. Many people are think that researchers researchers are only doing research and they're just true. A broad range of things which are expected from the researcher and which actually every researcher actually uh, get indulged in, in, into it. And uh, this researcher development framework divides it into, into the four domains. Sharon, your voice is going out. You sort of, uh, the voice disappears. I did draw. Tell him to unvideo. Unvideo yourself. Perhaps your 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 internet will be better. If you unvideo yourself, there's a icon on the bottom. Which Dr. Ra, his voice is muted. His mic is muted. Yeah, but he is go he was going in and out even when it was not. So Sharon, unmute yourself and now. Yeah, I sorry again. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's so, so yeah, there's this domain A that talk about knowledge and uh, intellectual abilities, personal effectiveness, research governance and organization, engagement, influence and impact. And some of the fa aspects which have already been discussed by um, other panelists. So I won't go into every single aspect, but uh, this is the huge amount of task each single researcher is expected to do that involves not only being creative, uh, you know, being very, uh, uh, you know, innovative, uh, bringing the aspect of critical thinking into it. And uh, besides this, a lot of enthusiasm, perseverance, integrity. Uh, this also involves, you know, handling of the budget, handling of the resources that are involved into the research management, finances, funding, uh, overall the management of the project. So some, when someone performs all these tasks, one of the very, uh, you know, big thing that hits all of the researchers is the stress and anxiety. You know, that is the point where a lot of people are waiting for the results and know this research is a process. It takes its own time to get the results. You always have to wait for a certain amount of time. So waiting for the results in while you are managing all these different aspects, it induces a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety. And then similarly, your interaction with your supervisor. Your supervisors are busy people and know this. Whenever you write to them, you always have to wait until they respond back to it, right? And if you are a supervisor, you always have to take some time to write, write back to the supervisee because you should know that they are they're waiting for your response to take the next step. But this kind of process is, is kind of very stressful. And above all, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Firasat earlier mentioned, there's a fear of failure always. Not every, every research project that you are doing will result in the success. So there's this failure. There is a pressure of meeting the deadlines. Your, you know, your friends will be graduating. You will find that, oh, the person is gone who started the project with me and I'm still working. So this, these kind of facts are over there. These, these, they induce a lot of stress. So in that situation, it's always a good idea to take breaks, uh, to uh, you know, find new motivation for yourself. And please know this one, one important thing, that research in any form, it, 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 it requires a lot of sacrifice in many ways. Everyone sacrifices their family time. Everyone sacrifices sometimes on their health. Everyone sacrifices on their personal time. There's a lot of sacrifice that goes with the research and it requires a lot of perseverance as well. And yeah, one other very important factor that uh, always induces stress on the, on the researchers is uh, your family and your friends asking that, oh, when are you completing your research? Have you completed your research? How much time is left? This is, this is something very important out there. And how to deal with this? Most of the time, what I used to do 
I just uh, told them that, yes, I'm working. So just wait until I, I, I break the news to you. But uh, until then, can we uh, not ask, uh, you know, keep asking these questions and uh, let me focus on my work and let me finish that. And once it's done, I will certainly be able to share it with all. But, you know, these, they, there are a lot of factors. The management of this big framework of doing research, there are social challenges, there are psychological challenges, and which, which impacts, and they actually tend to delay our work. So, you know, as a good researcher, as someone who eventually will be able to successful, is someone who manages these all things well. And one of the key things in all this is, as Dr. Subha mentioned earlier, that take breaks. Take breaks, give yourself time. Do not forget that you are a human being and you have a specific level of capacity that you can handle. So give yourself time and know this, that sooner or later, you all are running your own races and you will get there at different times, but the destination is, 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 uh, is there. If, if you are firm and if you, you, are, uh, you are persistent on that. Thank you so much. Over to you, question and answers. And sorry for all the glitches that happened. No worries, Dr. Sharoon. Thank you. Well, now maybe we can start asking questions and we are happy to answer them if you have any. Uh, I noticed in the chat box there was a question from uh, Saima Akram who wrote from Punjab University and she was asking if it's okay to share your drafts with professors in other universities. I think there is no harm in doing that. But, uh, well, my suggestion would be to take your supervisor in confidence and also uh, just be realistic in terms of giving them a timeline. So once I received a draft from uh, a student, a PhD student at Punjab University, and she wanted me to give her feedback in just two days, which is not possible. Like we have a job and then we are working on our scholarly projects as well. Sometimes we have our deadlines to meet. So just be realistic there, give them at least a couple of weeks and then um, I think um, again there is no harm in asking scholars and professors from other universities if you think and when you are trying to convince your professor like when you are taking your own professor your supervisor in confidence uh, just be sure to give them good reason that well this person has also worked in this area so I think his or her feedback is going to be really helpful for me so I want to ask this person to take a look at my draft and that kind of thing so I'm sure they will be uh, considerate to uh, uh, your your supervisors will be considerate to that and um, yeah so now we can take questions uh, yeah I, I think through that question for us if my add button I have also noticed that many many times you are fearful of somebody stealing your idea. And that's a thing oh, yeah. you should be aware of. And I came across some stories whereby, or I read it somewhere, that when you sort of shared your concept with somebody, somebody else flew with it. And, uh, you know, and you felt miserable. So those are things, those are, I think, but you have to take those risks if you want good feedback. And if you have a good amount of feedback, please acknowledge. Uh, you must acknowledge the help that you took from other people in your preface. Gee, and any otherwise conflict or, or, yes, I agree, consent of supervisor, absolutely. Saima Majid and Sharoon both say that, yes, conflict, ethical obligation can come in. Uh, we do not see any other questions, and I see uh, that we are towards the close. Uh, I just would like to thank all of you, Farasad. I know you really took time to coordinate with the group. All of us are extremely busy right now in the summer or on holiday, and we are, you know, moving along with different paces at this time. Uh, but you brought everybody together. I'm especially thankful to Sharoon. He took some uh, quoting to agree. <laughs> he, it's so difficult to get him to agree. And then, of course, we have Subami. She's a young faculty who just joined us and has been amazing in her contribution to the campus. And then, of course, the clan, our own clan, Abha who is really ever willing to lend a hand and to help others. And he does an immense amount of learning on his own. And the best 
thing is that he is eager to share what he has learned with his own efforts. And that's very commendable. And so what a lovely team. It was a joy to end the sessions with you four, the best of our FCC in many ways, young and, uh, you know, energetic. You keep us motivated. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to our viewers for sticking it out with us all this while. Thanks a lot. Um, how can we find a good publisher who will accept the journal or research paper who will publish the thesis? Coming at the end of uh, the sessions, would you like uh, one of you care to answer? Subhameer or uh, uh, Firasat, perhaps? Yeah, sure. So what's the question again? How to find a um, good publisher who will accept your journal or research paper to publish? A thesis? Your thesis. Yeah. For dissertation, uh, well, um, you can certainly think about extracting papers and transforming them into publishable papers. Uh, I think that's a good idea. I also did that with my PhD, but that would need considerable revision. Uh, like it, 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 it should be different from what is in your dissertation chapter. I, I know in Pakistan too. After you have finished your dissertation, it goes to ProQuest, and it, it, it stays there. And uh, publishers are not interested in publishing something that is already published. And if you want to transform it into uh, a book, like a, a transforming a dissertation into a book, that too is possible. But um, uh, again, I am. Um, my suggestion and in my experience, because I have tried doing that, if you have already extracted too many papers from your dissertation, then uh, it can be difficult for you. However, if you haven't published already from your dissertation, then you can think about transforming it into a book. And in that case, again, that that would need um, a significant amount of revision. You can definitely transform it, like begin with a book proposal and then send it to um, editors. And um, there you can also mention that it's uh, it's coming from your doctoral dissertation and you did you spent considerable amount of time developing this project. And now you want to transform it into the form of a book. And in my experience, usually they are considerate, but again, they would ask you for revisions. I hope this answers. Very well. Uh, there are lots of thank yous which I can't go through, but I definitely would like to mention our international audience. Emilian from American University of Nigeria, uh, Veronique from American University of Refrain, uh, Alakwan University of Refrain, a beautiful university and a beautiful place. And of course, Sally. I do not know where is Sally from, but we are very, very heartened to see your, you know, comments saying that we did a good job. It always helps to get endorsements from all of you, from FC, from outside FCC, and from the international community. I really want to also thank Mavish, um, the co-head, I would say, in a way with the brilliance that she has at CLT. She joined us as a deputy head. But I see her very much as somebody who, uh, you know, sort of uh, joins in um, as a digital expert and we mesh in well that way. And of course, Gohar. Gohar has been instrumental in keeping the Zoom links and the reminders going. And of course, uh, Ifra, we have a young girl who has just joined her and um, she has done a lot of behind the scenes work. Isra University, thank you. NAMS, Dr. Saida Rubab, then there is uh, Tamkeen Nishad, I do not know uh, from what campus. And NAMS again, thank you. There's so many thank yous and it heartens us 